to run for re-election and, and what factors you took into consideration when you're making that kind of a decision? I always decided that uh, that was my decision all along, that I would run for DA again. Mm -hmm. And the factors are the fact that I enjoy the job mm -hmm. and I've trained for the job for over 19 years. Mm -hmm. So this is the position that I want to be in and I feel, uh, I feel I can do the most good in and I'm the most effective in. And many people have asked me why I haven't run for judge and I, you know, of course I'm honored that people would think that I should run for judge or that I would, mm -hmm. but it's not where I see myself right now in my career. Um, and I don't want to uh, dwell on it for too long, but I just wanted to go back to your educational background. You attended Penn State for a while, but then, am yes. I correct, you switched to the University of Scranton? Yes, I, I attended Penn State for two and a half years, and you know, I don't talk about this very much, but unfortunately I then became uh, inflicted with arthritis. So it was difficult being at the main campus. You know, it's a very large campus. So I made the decision to move back to uh, where I lived in Pittston, and I went to the University of Scranton where I obtained my degree. Okay. And it looks like you were on a business, business track there for a while. Was that the plan? That, oh, that's was, it. The entire... Was law school the plan? I was that? always law school, but I thought what would go well with, with the law school, and if what law school didn't work out for some reason, I wanted to have a job <laughs> on the side. So, uh, so I always uh, thought about law school. Okay. And then graduated in 1982? 82 from the University of Scranton. In 1985, I went right to law school, to Temple University. Why and Temple? What was it about that uh, school of law that appealed to you? Oh, I thought it was a, a terrific school because it was right in Philadelphia, and they had a, a, a large number of female uh, applicants at that time, as I recall. There was great diversity at Temple, and it was very good education. Had you known anyone that attended Temple? At that point? Uh, actually, Judge Parentoni was at Temple. I knew uh, Dan Pillitz, okay. who's a law clerk. He was at Temple. Mm -hmm. Judge Agello went to Temple. So I, I, I did know some people. And then I knew other people who went to the dental school and, and uh, the undergraduate school. Okay. Uh, it was then 1986 that you accepted a full time position, <coughs> excuse me, as ADA in Lackawanna County? Yes, with that's correct. Ernie with Ernie Preet. Okay. Uh, that was a, a wonderful time uh, to be an assistant DA because Ernie was a tremendous trial attorney. Mm -hmm. And when he would try a case or he'd go into the courtroom for any reason, it was always packed. And uh, he was very skilled at what he did. Now, critics out there might suggest, you know, you, you have family, that family connections open the doors for you in Northeastern Pennsylvania. How would you respond to that? Well, actually, I graduated in 1985, and I went a few months looking for a job. I wanted to work in the Luzerne County DA's office, but I, there were no positions at that time, and uh, it was difficult trying to find work. So I found that there was a position in Lackawanna County. So when, when people think that I used family connections or I had a job waiting for me, that did not happen. I had just been married, and... Uh, yeah, again, I wanted to be a prosecutor, so I went to Lackawanna County where there was an opportunity. I interviewed on my own, and I recall that uh, Ernie Preade interviewed me, and he asked about my uncle, and I recall telling him, this isn't, uh, my uncle at the time was a senator, I said, this isn't about him, this is about me, and if you hire me, I want it to be on my qualifications. And he, he thought that was great. Now, if I'm correct, then you worked in Luzerne County DA's office in the late 1980s into the 1990s? Yes, I was an intern in the DA's office for Bob Gillespie. And then when Corey Stevens was elected DA, he contacted me. I was working in Lackawanna County at the time and asked if I'd like to come to Luzerne County. And it was, you know, pennies from heaven. It was wonderful. So he hired me. I worked for Corey, or I should say for Judge Stevens, and then for uh, District Attorney Jerry Cohen when he took over for Judge Stevens, when Judge Stevens went to the bench. I then worked for uh, Judge Peter Poloszewski when he was the DA, and Judge Lupus when he was the DA. Now, you did uh, leave the office for about seven years? Yes, I went into private practice, and uh, I found that it, you know, it was rewarding in the sense that I represented individuals and I helped them. It was personal injury cases that I primarily handled but I still longed to be back in the DA's office. So it's, it's less money than people make in private practice generally, 
but I found that I was happiest in the DA's office. What prompted you to make that change for a while, to decide, you know, your, your goal had been to be in the DA's office, then you decided maybe I'll try something else for a while. What, what was the motivation? Well, we, we had started a family, my husband and I, and uh, quite frankly, my brother was, a, uh, was in a law firm, a local law firm, and he had made partner. And when I compared my salary with his, I thought, yikes, there's a big difference here. So I decided to try the civil practice, and I did that for seven years. And as I said, I, I think I've helped a lot of people. I was, uh, became close to many of my clients. But when the chance came to go back to the DA's office, when uh, Dave Lupus contacted me and said, are you, willing, you know, are you willing to come back part-time? You can have a practice on the side. I did that. I thought that was a great combination. So then, when I had the opportunity to become first assistant, I, I did take a great cut and pay from, from what I had been making, but money wasn't everything to me, and it's still not. So I took that opportunity because I thought at that time that perhaps someday that I would run for DA. Now in 2007, uh, you campaigned on, on a couple different issues that were things that, that were important to you. Uh, one was a centralized crime sharing computer system so that the different police departments could Yes, have yes, the we same information. Yes, we do have well we have crime sharing meetings, but what I ended up developing was a precious metals database, which is a crime sharing database. So when someone turns something into a pawn shop, the information has to be filled out immediately. Now this is pursuant to state law, but you'll see that many district attorney's offices really don't give it a lot of attention. So what I did was put that into a computer system. So every single uh, pawn shop operator, we, we had a, a seminar for them. I presented at the seminar. I told them what was required of them. They had to get a computer, <coughs> excuse me, and they put that information right into the computer. And then that inf information, <coughs> excuse me, goes to our office. Mm -hmm. And all of the different police departments log on to that program. And it's so important, and what happens is they'll put in you know, a woman's ring, a man's ring, bracelet, whatever, and a description. They have to get the name and the address of everyone who's selling these items. Mm -hmm. So a uh, funny story was my grandfather was in a nursing home, 94 years old, and his ring was stolen. Mm -hmm. So right after we started the database, we checked the database, and the description of the ring was there, and the woman who had pawned it was his nurse's aide at the nursing home. So we were able to get the ring back, crack the case, and uh, the woman was prosecuted. So it was a perfect example of how we use that. So that's used throughout the county. Okay. Um, just to be clear, though, that that wasn't necessarily what you hoped for at the beginning with a centralized crime sharing computer system. That would have done more than... than well, I th yeah, I think you know we can put things into the computer. It would have done more, but again, when we find out that there's not a lot of funds okay. in the county. That was so my next question was why, why, why hasn't that been checked off the list as a matter of... It was, it was a very, very expensive system. Mm -hmm. So in what we do instead is we meet at a crime sharing meeting and different law enforcement agencies will meet there once a month, u month usually in Wright Township, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about crime sharing. The other thing is I've had several seminars and training um, opportunities where the police departments from across the county meet and we discuss issues that are pertinent to us. We just had um, a law enforcement summit last week put on by myself and U.S. Attorney Peter Smith and that was to solidify the relationships between our office, the federal government, local agencies and state agencies. It was a day-long training seminar but there was a great deal of interaction with all the parties where we shared information. And I think that's essential to law enforcement to share information. Let's say, for example, there are burglaries taking place in Avoca mm -hmm. with a certain MO. If we find that those are taking place in Kingston Township as well, we can share that information and hopefully solve the crime. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we have great relationships among local law enforcement. What would it, what would it take to, to get to that? I mean, have you explored to that level what it would take to, the funding it would take, the, the mechanism it would take to have that centralized sort of system? It, it's a matter of funds, and, and in the past four years, when I go to the commissioners for our budget meeting, uh, I think the first year we received a, a nice budget, but over the last three years we've been cut every time I've been there, 
and not because they don't want to give law enforcement the money, because the money is just not there in the county. So what I've done as an alternative, I looked for sources of money to bring into the office, and I started charging for ARDs. And we have brought in over $90,000 to date in the last year and a half, and we use that in our budget. So I, I think, you know, we have to have an eye towards um, being fiscally responsible, but also raising money to try to help combat crime. And I don't know of any other DA in Luzerne County that has actually brought money in to our budget. So that's the first thing. There are also other avenues I'm going to be looking at over the next several years, hopefully, to try to fund uh, some of the crime uh, fighting initiatives. I want to quickly go back again to uh, 2007. One of the other things that uh, you felt was important at the time was an updated case management system. Is that something that yes, Scanner has been implemented? We have that. Yes, we do. That has been implemented um, through PCCD, and it's, it's wonderful. We can go into that system, uh, check on cases. Uh, the entire support staff has that capability, and I do as well. And seeking more uh, grant money was important uh, to you at the time. Has, has that been successful? Yes. Okay. We, we were looking for a grant writer for the DA's office, but the commissioners compromised with me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I was afraid that was going to happen. Um, they compromised, and they hired a grant writer for the entire county. Mm -hmm. So her name is Michelle Sparage, and we've worked very closely with her. We've brought in funds for Internet Crimes Against Children, domestic abuse, um, special victims cases, and uh, several other grants that we've brought in through our working with Michelle. She works very closely with our office. So although I wanted the grant writer for ourselves, we're okay with sharing too. Okay. Uh, do you as district attorney have the inclination to personally prosecute cases? Do you think it's necessary or yes. appropriate to? Absolutely. I think a district attorney has to lead by example. And as I've mentioned, I worked for a number of different DAs. And I think watching the district attorney in the courtroom is especially important. When I assign cases to assistant DAs, we've had nearly 50 homicides in the last four years. I look at their abilities, their qualifications and experience, and I try to match those to the type of case. So um, without me knowing what the cases are going to entail, I think it'd be very difficult to say, here's a drug case, so-and-so, involving you know, a homicide, you handle it, when maybe that person is not inclined to handle those sorts of cases. So I think it's important for the DA to handle cases to know what the issues are, to be able to spot the issues, to determine what sort of experts are going to be needed. I love being in the courtroom. I wish that I had tried more cases in my first term, but I have five myself that were handled. Uh, one just went to verdict. We have a first degree conviction. Several of them um, are spending the rest of their lives in jail because during the um, jury selection, they pled guilty. So I think that's important too. And defendants don't plead guilty unless they think that there's a good case against them and they know the DA is ready. Uh, I think, I've seen in my years, sometimes you get right into the courtroom and they'll assess the situation and then they'll make their determination. So if they know you're not prepared or you're not qualified, they're not pleading guilty. So I love being in the courtroom. I, I've been in the courtroom for four, these last four years handling the pretrial matters and the trials themselves. I think that's essential. Um, I want to make sure I have my numbers correct. Uh, for the DA's office currently, it's about about 67 employees, nearly 30 ADAs, 10 county detectives, you might in the ballpark. You're right. You're right on. Okay. What do you consider the office's biggest challenge in the next few years, then? Well, I think manpower is certainly a challenge. I have had many of the assistant DAs come to me very concerned that they're handling just too many cases. So I try to look at the cases and make a determination if, if they're going to take an awful lot to prosecute. <clears throat> Someone may have 70 cases, and those cases may be minor. I would not give that many cases to someone with serious cases. So I look at it as a coach, has to see what the strengths are of the people on the team and uh, address those accordingly. 
I think manpower is an issue. Certainly funding is an issue. We're seeing it right now. We had, I believe, five homicide cases go to trial this year. It costs money to take a case to trial, to pay for experts, to pay for witness fees, uh, when, when we have to pay for their travel, their lodging. Um, it takes money. So I think money and manpower are going to be issues. And um, what how are you preparing to meet those challenges? And, and maybe that goes back to something you referred to earlier, that you had some programs that you'd like to, or maybe those are different. But. Well, no, I think that's a good point. Diversionary programs are important mm -hmm. because they keep minor cases out of the system mm -hmm. and they're handled in a different way, so they do not use the manpower or the resources that we have. We could talk about those initiatives, I, I guess, when you want to, or maybe in a moment, but um, I think knowing the strengths and the weaknesses of the people in the office and what their likes are, what their abilities are, um, when I make the determination who handles what case. I think that's important because we need to use our resources accordingly, especially when we don't have a lot. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead, if we could, and talk about some of those programs that you would like to explore in the future. Well, the um, most significant one that I think I've started recently is the Youth Aid Panel Program. That keeps first-time and minor offenders of juvenile cases out of our system. They meet with a community panel. There are no attorneys, no defense attorneys, no assistant DAs. There aren't any police officers. There are no judges. There's a, command, a panel of community volunteers. The juvenile will appear before the panel, describe what the crime was, what happened. Their parents will be there or their guardian. And then they leave the room. And then these community volunteers make a determination regarding what they think the conditions are they can put on this child or juvenile. And they give them three months to complete the conditions. They can have them write an essay, build a model, um, volunteer at a soup kitchen, et cetera, so that the juvenile has to be accountable for what they've done, but they don't have to go into the criminal system. There is an 80 to 85 percent success rate across the country with these panels. That means we never see these kids again in the system. So it takes it one step beyond the schools. Maybe these kids are used to going to the principal, are used to being punished by their parents, but now they're in front of this community panel knowing this is your last chance. If you don't straighten out and you know, stop the activity that got you in trouble, then you're going into the juvenile system. Mm -hmm. But there are some cases that absolutely have to be in the juvenile system. They're just serious cases. Uh, have you been able to attract enough volunteers for those panels at this point? Is it we, that there's yes, we've been overwhelmed with volunteers. We actually, sadly to say, had to turn some away. And they're from all walks of life. We have school teachers, mechanics, um, housewives, retired people. And we interviewed them. They went through a lengthy interview process. And uh, as a result, we have 67 volunteers right now. We have more waiting to be on the panels. Just a curiosity, are there many washouts through that, that screening process? Of, there of, people that you, when you, you oh, there were some. Well, there were some people that we determined were looking to punish the kids and maybe had a different philosophy. Had agenda, exactly. So those those people we we didn't yeah. select those, but some were very qualified. We just had too many people. We had a great number of PhDs that were interested. I mean, an overwhelming number of educated people who were interested. And again, it was sad to say we don't have any more room. But we have their names, we have their numbers, and we're going to be you know, contacting them if we need to. But I've also been successful in finding funding for the Youth Aid Panel Coordinator through the um, area, uh, the Family Services Association had money left over and uh, children and youth because the placements were down in juvenile court. So through the grant writer, we applied to get that money and we were able to bring on a youth aid panel coordinator. He is a retired teacher from Hazleton, and he coordinates the entire program. So it's, it's been a win-win situation so far. We've had, I believe, six uh, juveniles who have gone through the program successfully at this point, and we're going to be graduating more pretty, pretty soon. 
I don't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say the mentoring program that was just started by King's College and the Public Defender's Office. We're going to dovetail with that program, so our youth aid panel members can send some of these juveniles to the mentoring program. So they're going to work hand in hand, and I think the mentoring program is going to be a home run because we see many of these youth who are troubled and they just don't have any direction and a lot of them are really smart. Um, I've been to some of the panels and I've listened to these kids and I think boy, they just don't have any direction. So if they can go to college and, and, and um, meet with these college students and see, be in a college building, in a college atmosphere and listen to these other students say, hey, you know what? I was in trouble and I got out of it by doing the right thing and working or I got through it maybe they'll end up in college. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be a great program. Okay. Uh, wondering how you think the switch to, uh, from the commissioner setup to the new uh, Luzerne County Council, how might that affect the DA's office? I'm kind of nervous about it because it's going to be something new and I, I don't think anyone really knows how it's going to work until it, it gets in place. But I've met many of the people who are running and I'm, I'm hopeful they're very interested, they're enthusiastic. I, th I think it's going to be a really good thing. But like any other transition, you know, we're going to have growing pains, I, I, I think. But hopefully they'll appreciate the work that's done in the DA's office and they'll help us with our resources where they can. And uh, are there new programs, uh, in the, anything, projects in the pipeline or under consideration that you'd like to implement in the next few years? Well, another, I, I, I read recently a, an article in the New York Times about jury panels made up of juveniles who have been through the system or who have been through these diversionary programs. And the juvenile will appear before a panel of his peers, literally. And we, we have one juvenile with 12 other juveniles, and he gives a story about what happened. They know if it's true, they know if it's not true. And I've seen that they're working across the country as well to help keep kids out of trouble. They can impose conditions as well. So that's a program, I just recently saw that, and I thought that sounds like something we can maybe implement here. That I'm looking at. I'm also um, in contact with other counties to determine how they bring funds in. And I've been doing that for years. But I found that it's possible to tack on fees to some of these drug cases where the drug dealers would have to pay fees and some of it, court costs, would go to the DA's office. But that, again, goes hand in hand with our forfeiture program. I've really for, uh, formalized the forfeiture program. We meet on a regular basis. There are three attorneys in our office and two detectives. We have a procedure in place where every assistant DA who goes to court on a drug case fills out a form to determine whether or not there are any assets. Was a car seized? Were funds seized? Uh, that sort of thing. And then we file our petitions and we go after those funds. We have brought in thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into our forfeiture fund. It's a confidential fund. I can't tell you how much is in there. But that can be used by state law to train police officers and also to buy equipment. So through that forfeiture program, we have bought vests for police officers, tasers, uh, heat-seeking equipment, lights, um, computers. We've sent them to all sorts of training. So that has been a tremendous source of funding, and it has really benefited the law enforcement community. Two questions. Why does it need to be secret? It's um, confidential because it's drug money that comes in, so it comes from investigations. So under state law, it's confidential. I've had this issue many times in the beginning with our uh, commissioners. Why can't you use that money for salaries? I would love to use that money for salaries, but it's prohibited because it's not in a uh, steady source. We don't know when it's going to come in. We don't know how much it's going to be. Um, Could that be used for the crime sharing? initiative to? It might be. I had discussed that with the Attorney General's office and that's something that they're reviewing so that, that we may be able to do that. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's good. Um, I think we covered a, a number of the initiatives um, 
We talked a little bit about the UK panels. We mm -hmm. talked about the uh, forfeiture unit, the precious metals. Um, there are a couple others here, if we could just uh, go over quickly, uh, that you've been involved with. The Lutheran County Child Advocacy Center. That, who, that who, I who, most... What organization was the driving force behind that, would you say? That's something I have wanted to do for years. Okay. There are, I believe, 20 or 21 centers in Pennsylvania out of 67 counties. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous asset for our young people the children who have been sexually and physically abused, in the past, they would go to the police department or children and youth. They would have to tell their story with their parents. They would then go to the DA's office. They would then go to a hospital if it's warranted to be examined. So you have this little child, maybe six or seven years old, going to all these facilities, meeting with all these strangers when they've been through a terrible time. And when I first started prosecuting cases, I did primarily child abuse cases. So this is something that I've always wanted to do. And when I became the DA, I had the opportunity to put it into place. But what happens is a child will come to the center after they've reported what has happened. And there will be one individual interviewing the child at a time. They will be in a facility that we have through Geisinger, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the child will be in the room with one person. There's a camera on the child which feeds the what's happening into an upstairs room where the detectives sit, the DA sits, children and youth. There may be six people upstairs, but that child only has to talk to one person. So it's less intimidating. And when they tell their story what had happened, if they have to be physically examined, we have an examining room right at the center. We bought a colposcope, which is something that uh, helps to examine the child. We have that a waiting room, an examining room. We had hoped to have a doctor come to the center, but we have a doctor in Wilkes-Barre who likes to examine the children. He's more comfortable at his own office, but he's affiliated with Geisinger. There are young Geisinger doctors who have now volunteered through the Geisinger system to do the exams right there at the center. We have a great partnership with Geisinger Wyoming Valley. I was looking around um, different facilities and office buildings, maybe for a room this big, to call it our Child Advocacy Center. When I went to Geisinger, they asked me about the program. I told them, and I said, you know, Lackawanna County has a house. They've been very lucky. They said, we have two houses. Do you want a house? It, it was just too good to be true. So we walked across the street. There were two houses that were convents that were run by the Sisters of Mercy. They said, take your pick. And I said, well, we don't have any money to buy these houses. They said, no, we will give you the house for a dollar a year. So for a dollar a year, Geisinger gave us the house. They refinished the entire things, uh, the entire thing they put new carpeting, the women's auxiliary um, from the hospital, put curtains, they paint it, they put decorations. It, 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 the whole community came together. So I really think Geisinger has to be applauded for what they did. They, they did a wonderful job with us and for us. Uh, one of the other programs I wanted to ask about was the Bad Check program. That's another revenue producing well, it's not, well, we, we don't get a lot of revenue from that. We have a few thousand dollars a year, but what it does is gives restitution to the merchants who are victims. And then the person who writes the bad check has to go to a program where they maybe spend four to five hours in a, a rehabilitation program to teach them how to manage their money. Because we know when people write bad checks, sometimes they're just in a financial uh, downspin. So this helps them with managing the money, <clears throat> and then they make restitution to the merchants. The merchants love the program. We've brought in over $100,000 in restitution so far. And then how does the county get money to help defray some of its costs from that? They have to pay, the person who goes through the program has to pay a fee of $165, and we get the fee uh, for the program. So as I said, it's not a real money maker for our office, but it keeps these bad check cases out of the system so we don't have to put a lot of resources in to prosecuting those 
And as I said, the merchants, they love the system. And because they don't have to spend time in court either. I know we went over them quickly. Are there other, other uh, achievements, initiatives that you'd like to emphasize that you've been involved with? I think the two most important so far have been the Child Advocacy Center and the Youth Aid Panels. I, I think they're, they were very important. I think it was very ambitious in my first term to actually, and I was very lucky, I have terrific people that, that worked with me on this, and the people in our office um, worked very hard. So it's, I think it's the fact that I've been in the office for a long time. I know who is capable of what. I know what their interests are. And I know our child abuse unit, our special victims unit, had wanted this center for a long time. So um, we worked very hard together to get this done. But I'm always looking for new initiatives. I'm always looking for what other departments are doing, what other DA's offices. And I'm going to hopefully have the chance to continue to do that. Why should voters choose you over your opponent? Well, I think experience is essential for everything that we have spoken of this morning. I, I do not run, want to run a negative campaign, but I, I must say I honestly do not know how someone who is not qualified can run this office and make good decisions. I think it's one thing to say that, you know, I will be surrounded with experienced people, but I know in this job I often have competing forces. I may have two police officers saying, we're ready to make this criminal arrest on this homicide. I may have attorneys in the room who are arguing with each other saying, it's, we're just not ready. So the district attorney has to make that final decision. So having a person who is not experienced, I, I, I don't know how the job would be done. I honestly do not know. So um, knowing what I know, I think you need a person who is skilled in the law, who is skilled in the courtroom, who knows the defense attorneys, who has handled these cases personally. We also need a manager with the limited resources that we have to use them efficiently and effectively. So when, when voters go into the polls in November, if they vote for me, they know what they're getting. And I think you can talk to any of your reporters on your staff. I have given everyone my private cell phone number. I have calls in the middle of the night, on the weekend, holidays, etc. I'm very accessible. And uh, I make the decisions. I make the final decisions. And everyone knows that. So I think that's why voters should vote for me. Um, I think it's a responsible decision to make. Okay. Now, critics, including your election uh, opponent, uh, maintain, and I'm going to put this bluntly, that you and others must have been asleep at the wheel to allow the juvenile justice system to, to go bad in the way that it did apparently over a number of years. Um, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking and talking about that. but could I you absolutely know? have. I absolutely have uh, spent a great deal of time, and I've spent a great deal of t uh, time discussing it. I honestly think this may not be a popular answer, but it is a fundamental lack of understanding as to what occurred to say that people in the system should have known something. The former judge was a criminal on the outside of the courtroom. He was taking money for closing that center or whatever. However, inside the courtroom, what he did was he failed to put the juveniles right to waive their counsel on the record. That's what he did in the courtroom. He did not commit any crimes in the courtroom. This became a law in 2005 that a child has to waive their rights on the record. That procedurally, procedurally was not done. It should have been done. However, the assistant DAs who testified at the Interbranch Commission, and who, we've been looking into this since then, have um, said to me that the kids waive their rights sometimes three times, sometimes four, sometimes five times in writing prior to standing before the judge. There were waivers that they had to sign saying, we don't want an attorney. So when they came into the courtroom, the assistant DAs, the public defenders, they know if a child stood there without an attorney, they have just waived those rights in writing. So because the judge was not asking them about that on the record, they didn't think that it was an issue because they had the written documents. I've said that to the Interbranch Commission right from the beginning. I have explained that. But 
you know, it, it, what happened was terrible, what the judge did in taking that money, but there were two different actions that occurred. So what his motivation was for sending kids um, to these facilities, no one knows. Everyone in the courtroom thought the motivation was to do the right thing because a lot of these kids committed some really serious, terrible crimes. Now, if you go back to 1999 when Columbine occurred, and I've, and I've said this in, in many speeches and I've spoke to many people about this, there was a thought across the country of zero tolerance. Because if a kid comes into school and they threaten to kill someone, or they're wearing long coats, or they have backpacks, or they seem a little bit strange or different, how do we know they're not going to kill someone? How do we know this isn't the real deal? Well, in 1999 when this occurred, the entire country said, now you can't take that chance. There's zero tolerance. So if there are any ideas whatsoever, um, if something is happening in a school, the teachers sent the kids to juvenile court. They caught, and, and, that was, and that was rightfully done. But we're seeing now there's a, a movement away from zero tolerance, but the former judge it was engaging in the same activity in the way he sentenced the youth in 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, two, all the way through his tenure. But the juvenile center came into being in 2000, I believe the end of 2003, 2004. So it, nothing changed. The juveniles who appeared before him were being treated the same way that they were being treated in the earlier years. But because this whole thing broke where we found that he was taking money, then the nexus was made. Well, he was sending them away for money. I don't know what his motivation was. I have no idea. But the, the people in the courtroom did not see any change. So there were no red flags. There were no lights and sirens that went off that said, oh, all of a sudden, he's now sending everybody to juvenile, to juvenile hall or to a detention center. He did that anyway and he was thought of as a tough judge. Judges have different reputations. So that's my explanation. And it's, it's not a spin, it's not trying to change things, it's what I truly believe occurred. In terms of uh, red flags though, um, some of the transcripts um, that were released seem a little bit damning. That, that um, There was an attitude that almost seemed, what's the word, flippant or what happened? By the judge? Yes. He, well, judges have personalities. Mm -hmm. I have appeared before judges who were very tough, mm -hmm. extremely tough. I've appeared before other judges who were more forgiving. Uh, some judges, they want, they tell the, the attorneys in the courtroom, stand up straight, speak louder, stop talking, I've heard enough. Or, you know, some who, who are, just have a different personality, they're people. Um, yes, he was, he was harsh. But no one knew that it had a connection to him being a criminal. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to give you a chance to respond to something in particular that uh, your opponent, I think, cites on a website about a brief that you wrote in May 2008 to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court urging it to, um, and quote from the, from the website, uphold the convictions of three juveniles despite the fact that they had no legal representation. Absolutely, and again, that's a fundamental misunderstanding on my opponent's part or who's ever helping her uh, manage this campaign. A King's Bench warrant is an extreme measure by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So when this handful of juveniles came forward and said, we didn't have attorneys, we want to go to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, that wasn't the avenue that they should take. And guess what? The Pennsylvania Supreme Court agreed with us. I am the chief enforcement, uh, chief law enforcement officer in the county. I have to enforce the rules and the law. Under the law, it was not the right avenue to take. So we brought those juveniles back in. I believe there were four or five. We gave them a new trial before the judge, a new hearing. We said, you know what, you didn't have attorneys. You are now saying you wanted attorneys. You can have them. Do you know a number of them said? after fighting that, we don't want attorneys. They still didn't want attorneys. But they appeared before the judge. So in fairness, we said you can have your new hearing. But then, after that, it came to light that there were many, many, many kids who were saying, 
you know, we may have waived our rights or we may have signed those papers, but now we want attorneys. So I argued before Judge Arthur Grimm, who was the special master appointed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and he was actually surprised, and he told me that. He said, I thought you were going to be fighting to uphold these convictions. We researched the law, we spent a lot of time, and I came to the determination that if these kids are now saying they don't want lawyers, even though, are now saying they want them, even though they didn't want them before, out of a sense of fairness, I agreed to vacate all of those convictions because I thought it was the right thing to do. And that's what we did. So the accusations that are being made against me are baseless. They show a lack of under, misunderstanding. It's, it's a misunderstanding and a lack of understanding as to what actually occurred. But they're not taking the time to look into that. I think the most important question is, what qualifies anyone to sit as the district attorney and do this job? That's the issue. Not just hurling mud or uh, having a negative campaign. That'll go so far, absolutely. That's gonna resonate with, with, with some people. But in the end, there's a choice to make. And I think, you know, do you want someone who's been an attorney for 26 years, who has lived in this community their entire life, who has raised a family, who has seen these issues, who has worked for five different DAs, who has tried cases, or do you want someone who is going to make negative accusations, but, but where's, where's the substance? And I think that's the question. And I think voters have more sense. I think that they're going to want to know what will our DA do for us, and are they capable? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Uh, I do need to point out, though, that it, it, not just a political opponent who has found uh, maybe some unfavorable or brought up some unfavorable things, but the Interbranch Commission on Juvenile Justice also. Right, and if I, I'd love to answer that. I, mm -hmm. the, the Interbranch Commission was made up in part by juvenile judges who are part of the Juvenile, um, Juvenile Court Judges Commission, the JCJC. There were statistics that judge, former judge, ex-judge Chivarella was sending kids to placement more than any other counties um, of its size and, and certainly more than any, any other counties uh, across the state. But that commission was looking to see what happened, what, what is the fallout. Now, I testified and my testimony is online and it's, it's, uh, you can see it on video. I explained to them what occurred. They felt that the assistant DAs were not fully trained, that they should have seen that he was not reading this on the record. So they're individuals as well and they had an opinion that the DA should have been better trained. What I did as a result of that, I didn't just sit back when I became the DA and said, oh, that's somebody else's problem. I took the problem head on. I appointed two assistant DAs. I made sure that they were fully trained. We have a written training manual that we made up that they have to go through. I make sure that they go to all of the training courses that are available across the state. And um, we have the juvenile court round table that we sit at with Judge Lupus, all of the people who are involved in the system. We have the juvenile task force that uh, sits with people from across the state. So, you know, sometimes you find yourself in circumstances. I think the real measure of a person is, what do you do about it? Now, they, there were statistics that went to some of the ju these judges who were on the commission. When a, one of the senators testified at the inner branch commission, she had said, I know you had statistics, I know that they were out there, but I understand it's very difficult when you, you're undermanned, you're overworked, and you didn't do anything with these st statistics. So they got a pass, and I didn't agree with that. Would, would they have seen that the, judges, the judge was sending people to detention at an alarming rate? They should have through the statistics. We didn't see any statistics, we only knew this is how the judge operates. This is how he's been operating for years. But my point is this. Any system can be made better. Any organization can be made better. This gave us the opportunity to shine a light on the juvenile system in Luzerne County to see if we can make it better. And I have been working very, very hard to make this system better. And let me tell you something. William Listenby was the, 
one of the people on the Interbranch Commission who questioned, questioned me and went pretty hard on me with a lot of his questions. I had answers. But he was very upset with our entire system here. In May, he gave the commencement speech at Wilkes University, and I was there because my oldest son graduated. When I found that he was going to be the speaker, I thought, well, he, I don't know what he's going to say. Hopefully, he will not be very hard on us, um, the people in the system, because we've been working. Everything I did to change the system, I informed the Interbranch Commission. So at the commencement, he mentioned me by name and several other people in the system in front of thousands of people and in front of my son um, to say that we've really made a difference. And the system is on its feet thanks to, and he said in part, Jackie Musto Carroll. So needless to say, I was, I was very pleased. But if you look at that interbranch commission report, my opponent and her supporters are looking at the top of the page. And I know I'm kind of technical at times. But if you look toward the bottom of that page, the, the Interbranch Commission does say that I have taken back the reins of the DA's office. And I have taken control and have regain, retaken my prosecutorial authority. But nobody has reported that. It's on the same page. Because they know that the, cha the changes that have been made. So now you know that. Thank you for that. Um, some of the attorneys who've come before us in the last two years, uh, who, are, who I believe are running for judge, have intimated that the juvenile court was considered maybe less significant by some people um, when it was considered at all. What do you think might have led to that kind of an attitude? Well, you know, there are assignments that are made with different DA's offices, and oftentimes, uh, and this is not Luzerne, just Luzerne County, this is everywhere. I worked in Lackawanna County as well. They would make assignments to some of the younger DAs to handle that court. Not everybody handled juvenile court. I never handled juvenile court. I never got that assignment. Um, my assignments were for child abuse cases, drug cases, um, you know, burglary, assault, and then into homicide cases. So it's the path that I took. I think maybe some people did have that idea because they thought, well, it's juvenile court. Maybe when they, you know, they turn 18, they won't have a record. There aren't a lot of consequences, but that's not true. We found, and I've been telling kids across the county in the schools that I go into, you don't necessarily have your record expunged at 18. So if you commit a juvenile offense, that's serious. And it can affect your um, college applications, job applications, college aid. It can have a lot of ramifications. So. Whether or not juvenile court was looked at, as some said, kitty court, probably some people did look at it that way. They do not look at it that way anymore, especially in Luzerne County. This has given us an opportunity to make changes. As I said, any organization can do better. This has given us the opportunity to make wonderful changes. And I've testified, as I said uh, before the branch, Interbranch Commission, I've testified before the Pennsylvania Bar Association. I have traveled across the state. I have spoken about what we've done here in Luzerne County, and we've received a lot of praise for the changes that we've made. Uh, are there other things out there that are being said during this campaign uh, season that you feel are off target, or have we, have we <laughs> covered things that you feel might misrepresent you that you want I, to address? The, the only things that I've seen are basically the, uh, the juvenile issue. Okay. I, I don't, I haven't, Oh my God, are there more things out there? <laughs> oh. Well, I do want to uh, ask you. Yeah, um, retired Senator Ray Musto, would be your uncle? Is that That's right? my uncle, okay, yes. Correct. Okay, he's the subject, obviously, of a, a corruption uh, investigation. Right. Some people uh, might try to draw that into this race. I'm just wondering what you want voters to know about. Uh, well, you don't know, I've, I've been asked that question. I think it's a fair question. He was a state senator and a representative for nearly 40 years. I do not think you could discount the good that he's done for a lot of people. He's helped a lot of people. Um, he is facing federal charges. I do not have anything to do with those charges. I, that's being handled solely by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI, so there's no conflict. Do I feel bad about that? Absolutely. He's my uncle. I love him. I think he is a good man, but he has to answer these charges. There's no doubt. My grandfather was a state representative for nearly 25 years. 
He initiated the first black lung legislation before there was federal black lung. He worked out of his house, out of the front room. I was there all the time. We lived very close. He ran a grocery store and a barber shop, a little mom and pop grocery store, raised a wonderful family, he and my grandmother. So I'm very proud of, of my father's family and their legacy of, of public service. Um, I feel very bad about these charges, but he has to answer for them like anybody else. And uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, on, the, on the subject, uh, separate from that case, obviously, but on the subject of the widespread corruption investigations in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, without divulging any specifics, is it your sense that those investigations are ongoing, that, that prosecutions might be forthcoming? They are ongoing, there's no doubt. But when you deal with the federal government and you deal with the local DA's office, there are differences. I've, I've been very transparent and open, but the Department of Justice runs the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI and all of the federal agencies. They cannot give out some of the information that, that we are able to on our cases. I can tell you this, I have worked hand in hand with the FBI during this corruption probe when it was at its height. The FBI used an office within the DA's office. I assisted them in every way possible, um, and I cannot detail that assistance. They will not confirm and they will not deny anyone who works with them. They can't do that under the Department of Justice rules. But I think it was very telling for the public to know that the United States Attorney Peter Smith and myself held a law enforcement summit just last week to bring together all of law enforcement. I think that is an outward sign to show the public um, that we are working together. We're going to continue to work together. I do not think I'm going to be violating anything by saying that the corruption probe is ongoing. But with, with, the, with the case with my uncle, I have been completely cordoned off from that in all aspects. Okay. Just a, a couple more questions. I know we're going long here, but I appreciate you. I talk, I talk too <laughs> no, much. No, it's, it's a number of questions I'm, I'm shooting at you, so thank you for being patient with us. Uh, just wondering how you feel crime might be changing in northeastern Pennsylvania and, and how law enforcement is or is not adapting to that right now. It's more dangerous. It's more violent. And uh, I think, you know, where people may have hit or punched each other before or argued, they're just taking their guns out and shooting each other. They're stabbing each other. Um, there is a real um, heightened sense of urgency among law enforcement in dealing with this. When they walk up to a car now, they don't know what they're going to be facing. So it's, uh, it's something that we're aware of. There are a lot of gangs in the area. There's a tremendous drug trade because people use the drugs. If we could somehow stop people from using drugs, they'll stop coming here and selling them. Um, the issue with bath salts. Bath salts make people crazy. There's no other way to put it. They are higher than any other drug. Um, when they take the people get high, they do crazy things, they become paranoid. We're dealing with that. I think it's important to note that when this came to light in our county um, just earlier this year, Lackawanna County immediately moved for a ban for the bath salts. We were the second county to do that. And uh, we saw some horrendous cases of people thinking there were people in the walls and just acting um, outrageously. So we acted before the state had a chance to act to ban the bath salts. We obtained the injunction within uh, a few weeks of starting that. So we're very responsive. We're aware of what's going on. These crime sharing meetings are extremely important. We're having a um, gang expert come in to talk to law enforcement in this area. That's going to be in a few weeks. So I think the first thing you need to know about a problem is whether or not it exists. We know there's a problem, and now we have to find ways to combat it. And I, I live here. My parents are elderly. They live here. My children live here. Um, my whole family. So I want this to be a great community. I want it to be safe. And that's, that's my job. And I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, questions from the group at this point? Do you have anything? Uh, how much do you expect to spend on your campaign? Well, we spent about 30000 As of the last reporting period, we had about 30000 And we're raising more money. I'm, 
I'm guessing we may spend between another fifty or seventy-five thousand. And I'm not a great fundraiser. I did not uh, beat the bushes or shake the trees over the last four years trying to raise money. I did my job, and hopefully that will speak for itself. I know my opponent is spending a great deal of money. Um, I've seen several different types of commercials, radio ads, signs. Um, I don't have the money to compete with, with that in, in an advertising campaign. What I have is, is uh, I hope, people see as solid experience, and uh, I hope that they look at what I've done over four years. I've been very visible, I've been very vocal, I've been very open to the press. I'm going to continue to do that. So we're going to spend what we can to hopefully get my message out there, but I've been doing it the old-fashioned way, going to rallies, um, talking to people. We're, we have signs that we're putting up, and I have another rally coming up at the end of October. So we've been getting a good response in that regard. You know, it's a shame that that there is so much money put into some campaigns, and if you don't have money, it's hard to compete with that. Are you accepting contributions? Yes. Do you want to make one? No, I'm just joking. Yes. Do you uh, have limits that are set on your contributions? No, there are no uh, legal limits that are set. But I'm seeing contributions. Some some of them are twenty-five dollars. Some are fifty. Uh, sometimes a couple hundred dollars. Um, that, that sort of thing. Family members are, are trying to help out. So uh, I have not set a, a, any sort of limit, but I can tell you this, people who gave to me in 2007 know that they didn't, they didn't get any special treatment. No one did. No one did. Everyone's treated fairly. Everyone's treated the same. And all I do is enforce the law. If someone gets caught in doing something wrong, it doesn't matter who they are. Now, there are times that our office has a conflict or I have a conflict with the defendant. I immediately ship those out to the Attorney General's office or to the U.S. Attorney's office if there's federal jurisdiction. So, and I think that I've gained that reputation that they know I'm a straight shooter and regardless of what anyone gives me, it does not make a difference. Other questions from the group at this point? Do you feel that this uh, endorsement interview, we asked the appropriate questions and you had a chance to answer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think they were, they were good questions and they had to be asked, sure. Anything that we didn't ask about that you particularly wanted to mention? Uh, you had a great answer to a question that just never came up or anything that, that we might have glossed over that you want to emphasize? No, I, I, I'm sure when I leave and I get in the car, <laughs> there'll be all kinds of things in my head. But no, I, I think it was a fair interview. Okay. Thank you for the conversation this morning. We appreciate Thank you. Thank you. voters to know about well, you don't know, I've, I've been asked that question. I think it's a fair question. He was a state senator and a representative for nearly 40 years. I do not think you could discount the good that he's done for a lot of people. He's helped a lot of people. Um, he is facing federal charges. I do not have anything to do with those charges. I, that's being handled solely by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI, so there's no conflict. Do I feel bad about that? Absolutely. He's my uncle, I love him, I think he is a good man, but he has to answer these charges, there's no doubt. My grandfather was a state representative for nearly 25 years. He initiated the first black lung legislation before there was federal black lung. He worked out of his house, out of the front room. I was there all the time, we lived very close. He ran a grocery store and a barber shop, a little mom and pop grocery store raised a wonderful family, he and my grandmother. So I'm very proud of, of my father's family and their legacy of, of public service. Um, I feel very bad about these charges, but he has to answer for them like anybody else. And uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, on, the, on the subject, uh, separate from that case, obviously, but on the subject of the widespread corruption investigations in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, without divulging any specifics. Is it your sense that those investigations are ongoing, that, that prosecutions might be forthcoming? They are ongoing, there's no doubt. But when you deal with the federal government and you deal with the local DA's office, there are differences. I've, I've been very transparent and open, but the Department of Justice runs the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI and all of the federal agencies. They cannot give out some of the information that, that we are able to on in our cases. 
I can tell you this. I have worked hand in hand with the FBI during this corruption probe when it was at its height. The FBI used an office within the DA's office. I assisted them in every way possible. Um, and I cannot detail that assistance. They will not confirm and they will not deny anyone who works with them. They can't do that under the Department of Justice rules. But I think it was very telling for the public to know that the United States Attorney Peter Smith and myself held a law enforcement summit just last week to bring together all of law enforcement. I think that is an outward sign to show the public um, that we are working together we're going to continue to work together. I do not think I'm going to be violating anything by saying that the corruption probe is ongoing. But with, with, the, with the case with my uncle, I have been completely cordoned off from that in all aspects. Just a, a couple more questions. I know we're going long here, but I appreciate you. I talk, I talk too <laughs> no, much. I'm sorry. A number of questions I'm, I'm shooting at you, so thank you for being patient with us. Uh, just wondering how you feel crime might be changing in northeastern Pennsylvania and, and how law enforcement is or is not adapting to that right now. It's more dangerous. It's more violent. And uh, I think, you know, where people may have hit or punched each other before or argued, they're just taking their guns out and shooting each other. They're stabbing each other. Um, there is a real um, heightened sense of urgency among law enforcement in dealing with this. When they walk up to a car now, they don't know what they're going to be facing. So it's, uh, it's something that we're aware of. There are a lot of gangs in the area. There's a tremendous drug trade. It's because people use the drugs. If we could somehow stop people from using drugs, they'll stop coming here and selling them. Um, the issue with bath salts. Bath salts make people crazy. There's no other way to put it. They are higher than any other drug. Um, when they take the people get high, they do crazy things, they become paranoid. We're dealing with that. I think it's important to note that when this came to light in our county, um, just earlier this year, Lackawanna County immediately moved for a ban for the bath salts. We were the second county to do that. And uh, we saw some horrendous cases of people thinking there were people in the walls and just acting um, outrageously. So we acted before the state had a chance to act to ban the bath salts. We obtained the injunction within uh, a few weeks of starting that. So we're very responsive. We're aware of what's going on. These crime sharing meetings are extremely important. We're having a um, gang expert come in to talk to law enforcement in this area. That's going to be in a few weeks. So I think the first thing you need to know about a problem is whether or not it exists. We know there's a problem, and now we have to find ways to combat it. And I, I live here. My parents are elderly. They live here. My children live here. Um, my whole family. So I want this to be a great community. I want it to be safe. And that's, that's my job. And I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, questions from the group at this point? Does anyone have anything? How much do you expect to spend on your campaign? Well, we spent about 30000 As of the last reporting period, we had about 30000 and we're raising more money. I'm, I'm guessing we may spend between another fifty or 75000 and I'm not a great fundraiser. I did not uh, beat the bushes or shake the trees over the last four years trying to raise money. I did my job, and hopefully that will speak for itself. I know my opponent is spending a great deal of money. Um, I've seen several different types of commercials, radio ads, signs. Um, I don't have the money to compete with, with that in, in an advertising campaign. What I have is, is uh, I hope, people see as solid experience, and uh, I hope that they look at what I've done over four years. I've been very visible, I've been very vocal, I've been very open to the press. I'm going to continue to do that. So we're going to spend what we can to hopefully get my message out there. But I've been doing it the old-fashioned way, going to rallies, um, talking to people. We're, we have signs that we're putting up, and I have another rally coming up at the end of October. So we've been getting a good response in that regard. It, you know, it's a shame that that there is so much money put into some campaigns. And if you don't have money, it's hard to compete with that. 
Are you accepting contributions? Yes. Do you want to make one? No, I'm just joking. Yes. Do you uh, have limits that are set on your contributions? No, there are no uh, legal limits that are set, but I'm seeing contributions. Some, some of them are $25, some are $50, uh, sometimes a couple hundred dollars. Um, that, that sort of thing. Family members are, are trying to help out. So uh, I have not set a, a, any sort of limit, but I can tell you this. People who gave to me in 2007 know that they didn't, they didn't get any special treatment. No one did. No one did. Everyone's treated fairly. Everyone's treated the same. And all I do is enforce the law. If someone gets caught in doing something wrong, it doesn't matter who they are. Now, there are times that our office has a conflict or I have a conflict with the defendant. I immediately ship those out to the Attorney General's office or to the U.S. Attorney's office if there's federal jurisdiction. So, and I think that I've gained that reputation that they know I'm a straight shooter and regardless of what anyone gives me, it does not make a difference. Other questions from the group at this point? Do you feel that this uh, endorsement interview, we asked the appropriate questions and you had a chance to answer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think they were, they were good questions and they had to be asked, sure. Anything that we didn't ask about that you particularly wanted to mention? Uh, you had a great answer to a question that just never came up or anything that, that we might have glossed over that you want to emphasize? No, I, I, I'm sure when I leave and I get in the car, <laughs> there'll be all kinds of things in my head. But no, I, I think it was a fair interview. Okay. Thank you for the conversation this morning. We appreciate Thank you. it.